Hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. Today's question comes to us from uh, Philip R. Canterbury Jr., and he is N4PRC. And he has a very interesting question, and it's hard to answer in uh, 10 minutes a question of this magnitude, but I'll try and touch on the high points here. It says, hi Dave, I have gotten so much knowledge from all your videos. I would like to ask you if you can make a standalone video on ham clubs. How to get, keep, and grow a ham club. Our club is 29 years old. During and just after COVID, we could do a meeting around the dining room talk at a fast food restaurant. We got our numbers up to 20 paid members. We have a tech class of 21 that will be taking their test in a couple weeks. I would love to find ways to get, keep, and grow our membership. Any guidance you could give us uh, or also for your other viewers would be great. What is a ham club? It's a group of hams with similar interests, usually ham radio. Uh, sometimes a specific aspect of it, like DXing or uh, contesting. And they meet together. They have activities. They have uh, meetings. Um, and they enjoy each other uh, in person. Um, we talk about a conversation on the air as a QSO or conversation. Um, and in years past, people have called meeting another ham an eyeball QSO. It's an interesting turn on the phrase. Ham clubs come in a wide variety of shapes, forms, and so on. Some are rather moribund. It's the same five people who show up, and uh, others are quite active and growing, and people are having a good time. Now, this comes down in a very real sense to the leadership of the club. Um, the leadership of the club needs to have in mind a goal of what they want. Now, there is a truism in management that people will do what you want them to do if you're a manager. However, they do not learn what you want them to do by what you say. They learn to do what you want them to do by watching what you do, okay? This is true whether it's a church or a school club or an enterprise of some kind or anything like that. People know, after observing their leaders, what really, truly interests their leaders. I mean, you can find this uh, even in something as trivial as a leader growing a mustache. Before you know it, other people in the group will start growing mustaches almost unconsciously because the leader of the group uh, has done that. It's a, an interesting study in how humans work. Um, let me describe for you a club that uh, I think would be very interesting. There's a guy in Ontario, California, who was a ham, became a ham, did not uh, find a club around that he liked, Ontario is kind of in that vast stretch of city that stretches east from Los Angeles. It goes all the way out to uh, Riverside. There's a lot of people out there. And this guy decided to form his own club. So he got some of his friends together and got them to get their ham radio license and formed this club. And they went and got their friends and they started teaching, constantly teaching classes, constantly helping people through. Not just teaching a class, but mentoring each individual through the class. And then once they became hams, there was no leaving them alone for a month. They were immediately involved fully in the club's activities. And the club has an activity of some sort, whether it be a net on the air or a visit to the local airport to see the radio infrastructure or something like that. Um, every week, there's something every week. And then they meet, I guess, about once a month. And they all get to know each other. And this club has grown tremendously because there is a strong interest in the individual. 
Uh, there's a strong emphasis on having something for the members so the members uh, don't just come and, you know, sit and do nothing. It reminds me a story of a, a, a farmer who couldn't get his cows to come home uh, at night. And finally, a friend of his pointed out, you know, if you want them to come home, you'd better provide them some hay. And this is the same thing with the ham radio club. There's got to be something there that makes the people want to come. Uh, usually a ham club, meaning there are some business matters that need to be taken care of. Uh, there are officers that can be elected. I'll get into more of that in a minute. Um, but the most successful club, so I'm going to say this is best practice because the most successful clubs do this. They have the program first. Okay, and they can have this, uh, it could be uh, by one of their own members. They could invite some luminary to uh, speak to them, like their ARRL uh, leadership um, can come in via Zoom. Uh, and you can do a give and take. Uh, people love this with the ARRL leaders. Often an ARRL leader will travel to your location just to do this. Uh, you can have presentations on technical subjects by people in your group, or you can watch YouTube videos, and you're welcome to use my YouTube videos in your club meetings, okay? So there's a meaningful program. A person can go away thinking, okay, I'm glad I came to this meeting because I learned something. And uh, it doesn't need to be from the, the most uh, luminous soul there. I remember watching a, um, a presentation given in our club by a new ham. He talked about different kinds of tape that hams can use. And he showed a type of electrical splice tape made by 3M that I really liked. And I thought, wow, this guy has really done his research. And I've been using that kind of tape ever since. And that, that fellow is now treasurer of our club. Now, um, I would recommend that almost all of the committee reports, and so in the committee reports should be done in writing and in your club newsletter, which is probably posted on your club website, a Facebook website or uh, something like that. Put them up there for people to read. Um, then uh, if somebody needs help like the uh, you know, a couple weeks, three weeks or so before field day, you're going to have to have some club meetings to get things organized for field day. And that might take uh, several attempts. Field day is a big, giant, uh, or, uh, on the air get together at the end, the last weekend in June. So, um, yeah, try to expose your club members to less administrivia. Let the board take care of the administrivia and only bring before the club membership things that they should talk about and try and do it via the newsletter. So that when a person thinks of the club, they think of the presentations. Years ago, I was a member of the Lockheed Amateur Radio Club in Burbank, California. And I remember going down there at, at huge club meetings. And the presentation was from somebody from Collins who was talking about a speech processor that if you uh, try to modify the speech wave format audio frequencies, you create all sorts of uh, distortion artifacts. But if you raise that frequency up into the low RF range, then do the clipping, the harmonics are way outside the band, and then you can um, bring uh, mix that down to the audio again in those weird artifacts are gone. And I was absolutely fascinated. This was uh, Collins thinking way out in advance. I'm dating myself, obviously. I was uh, just out of college when I was uh, going to that club. Um, now, as far as the membership, you've got to somehow help members feel completely welcome. And part of that might be member spotlights um, where you can have one member interview another and do a few spotlights about them. Um, 
You can involve them on temporary assignments like uh, call the local uh, airport, towered airport, and ask them if they could, uh, you know, arrange a field trip for your people to meet down there some Saturday and see, for example, the radio network, how communications are done, and so on. Um, and you can get uh, guest speakers if you're in a populated area. You, you've got manufacturers all around that make things that pertain to audio. You can also get uh, salespeople from uh, the various manufacturers to talk to you. You can sometimes get marketing people from like Yesu Icom or uh, Kenwood uh, on Zoom to talk about latest products, product plans, and, and so on. And they're also very interested in the feedback that they can get. So there's lots of opportunities for programs. Now, we've got to talk a little bit about the legalities of what's going on here, uh, because you run into issues of liability and so on. I would recommend that your club uh, contact the, the state. It's usually the state um, secretary of state that uh, or the uh, state clerk or whatever who handles registrations of nonprofits actually for profits too uh, but get yourself a club name get it uh, into the system so that uh, other people aren't using it uh, note that some names like Arcadia or Glendale or something like that are in many many different states so you generally will keep it for your your own you could do you know, ham clubs or hams from Glendale, California, or something like that. Uh, and usually the ham name is arranged so that its initials form some sort of word. Like our club is Mark Montrose Amateur Radio Club. And it has a website, it has a Facebook page, and uh, doing all kinds of things like that. Now, so you get organized, uh, you have to write a constitution and bylaws, uh, which anybody who's had any experiences in clubs can do, or the Secretary of State can help you out. Also, contact the American Radio Relay League. Affiliate your club with the league. That way, when people are looking for clubs, they'll find you. Uh, I strongly suggest this. Now, 50% or more of the members of the club need to be members of the American Radio Relay League. So. This is uh, good if you've got a lot of new uh, people uh, in new technicians to get them there so they're subscribed to QST and they see other things that are going on. Now, um, ARRL also offers access to insurance for clubs and it's very, very inexpensive. Um, it's not often at a club that the ceiling falls in and everybody dies. So. Uh, it can be, a, I think, a mandatory thing that you need to do. So there's some ideas on clubs. Uh, here's some things not to do. Don't start out with the business meeting because nobody wants to sit in here that the club trailer committee has put new tires on the trailer. You know, that's great. There's been money expended. Let the board handle it. Um, if there's a contest coming up, sure, you want to talk about it a little bit. Uh, you know, if there's a state QSO party, that's a contest, and it's your state, and you guys want to participate, get people excited about doing that. Get the technicians over to homes of those with general class licenses so they can see how an HF contest works and so on. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll also upgrade training is something you should do. Uh, another thing um, is to not greet someone. No one who comes in that door should, you know, let, let me put it more positively, everyone who comes through the door should have their hand shaken, welcome to the club by name, and, uh, you know, a little bit of chit-chat about what they've been doing and so on. It, this idea of belonging is incredibly important. People go where they feel accepted. If they don't feel accepted, they won't come. It's as simple as that. So what I'm talking about is kind of a little bit of a change in orientation of the meeting, more emphasis on programming, training, 
um, and things like that. Less emphasis on administrivia, doing the administrivia after break so people who aren't interested can leave, um, or just handled by the board or whatever. The board usually consists of the president, uh, the vice president, a secretary, and a treasurer. Those, I think, are going to be the four officers you'll uh, learn have to be there. Now, if you're just starting a new club, it can be informal for a while, I'm sure, as it grows, because a lot of the informal clubs may meet for a few months and then dissipate. But if you really get something going like they have in Ontario there, you want to formalize that a little bit and be an ARRL affiliated uh, I recommend general purpose club, but it is possible to have special purpose clubs like just DX or something like that. Okay, so I hope that uh, answers your question, um, Philip, and uh, all of the people in your club. I, I sense through reading this that you're probably an officer of the club and are trying to continue to grow your membership and to recognize that it's very, very important that once you bring, you know, a person studying for their technician license is looking forward to the day of passing the test. And oftentimes they will have in their mind that that's the end of their journey. They've achieved their journey. When in fact, getting that license is the beginning of the journey. Okay, so people need to be helped over that step so that their horizons broaden a little bit. We want to get um, the new technicians, if only a UV5R, although I'd recommend the GS5R because it has uh, better emission specifications. Um, but you, you want to make sure they have equipment to get on the air and that they get on the air. And this is where the club the weekly club net comes in. And you may have to have the uh, new member go be sit with an older member to get over the mic fright. Mic fright is a very real barrier. So there are some ideas. I hope that those proved useful to you. That's certainly not a compendium of everything that can be said on running a good amateur radio club. There is excellent support at the league for clubs and you can even call them and get more uh, information along these lines. So there you have it, Philip. I hope that works for you. If you have watched this far in this video, you may be interested in subscribing and may be interested in helping support this channel. If you wish to support this channel, go to decastlercom support and look for a way that works for you. Until we next meet, 73.